Hello everyone, welcome to Lecture 6, A Sun-Centered Universe and Modern Astronomy. Oh, so we're going to talk about the motions that planets have. So planets move against the stars, basically as if stars were a background. Um, and because of a combination of their orbital motion around the sun and how slow the stars move around relative to us, it almost looks like planets move and the stars don't. Um, and the planets will always remain within a narrow band on either side of their ecliptic and the zodiac. Uh, basically, so every time the planets move so far, they end up in a new zodiac. That's why um, if you're born within a certain date to a certain date in a month, you are a certain zodiac. Okay. Um, there are very few bodies that actually move outside of the zodiac, um, and that is Pluto and Eris. But they will remain close to the ecliptic because orbits all lie on nearly the same plane around the sun. Meaning, we have the sun here, and pretty much every planet moves like this, for example. Okay, um, So they will always remain within a certain band of stars. They won't go beyond this. Meaning, we'll always see the same constellations, we'll always see the same zodiac signs because of this. Planets move from west to east past the stars, but rise east to west in our night sky. Why is this? It has to do with the rotation of Earth being faster than the other planetary orbits. Um, occasionally, this movement will reverse or seem to go backwards, which is known as retrograde motion. Early astronomical ideas was that because everything appeared to spin around the Earth, the Earth, therefore, must be the center of the universe, and this was based on work by the Greek astronomer Eudoxus, and it's known as the geocentric model. Basically, the Earth is the center of everything, and this be, was the, the accepted norm for hundreds of years. Okay? It, it, even in the Middle Ages, it was still the Earth is the center of the universe. The Renaissance, the Earth is the center of the universe. It actually wasn't until the Renaissance that we started to get questions that really started to take hold because astronomy had gotten to the level where technologically we were able to see very well compared to before. But compared to now, it wasn't very good at all. Uh, so Eudoxus used this model right here to explain retrograde motion uh, by tipping and rotating the axis of each sphere slightly um, a decent explanation of normal motion of the planets was actually created. However, he couldn't explain retrograde motion. Eventually, he came up with a very complicated idea containing two spheres. Um, but it wasn't until the Roman astronomer Ptolemy created a more complex model, model using this epicycle formation. Basically, we have an orbit around the sun, or an orbit around the Earth, okay? Um, and then the planet has its own orbit around the orbit which causes it to essentially make almost like a flower effect going around the Earth. Okay, at the same time, so this is our epicycle, at the same time a planet had its own rotation that it made, which was known as the deferent. Sounds a little bit confusing, right? But it was able to accurately predict planetary motion. So the idea was, Retrograde motion was when the epicycle carried the planet in the reverse direction, such as here. And then it would go back to its normal direction. This all had to do with the circle it would make. This brought it closer to Earth, making it brighter, but also made it appear to go backwards in the night sky. However, in, more to in order to make even more accurate predictions, he increased the complexity of the model. And this held until the 1500s. But with improved measurements and calculations made over the years, uh, increased discrepancies became apparent with Ptolemy's model, and in order to correct these, additional small epicycles were actually implemented. Uh, and then we get to Nicholas Copernicus. We've all heard of Copernicus. Uh, he was a Polish, Polish physician and lawyer, and he tried to make many modifications to the geocentric model before deciding to reconsider the sun-centered model or heliocentric model. In the heliocentric model, the sun is the center of the solar system rather than the Earth. And all orbiting bodies, including Earth, actually orbit the Sun. This model offered a much simpler explanation for retrograde motion, 
one planet on a smaller, faster orbit overtaking and passing a planet on a slower, larger orbit. The biggest example here is Mars and Earth. So here's our sun. Um, and so, you know, we have Mercury, Venus, Earth, and then, of course, Mars, right? These all have smaller and smaller orbits. Earth's orbit is quite fast compared to Mars. So as Mars travels around the sun, there are points where the Earth, starting here, will actually end up going faster, making it appear to go backwards instead. The Earth orbit is one year, our time. Mars's orbit is 1.88 Earth years. So every 780 days, Earth passes Mars, which makes it appear to go backwards. So Nicholas Copernicus came up with this theory before Galileo. And we're going to talk about Galileo in a bit, but I want to point out that Copernicus was in Poland. Galileo was in Italy. Nicholas Copernicus didn't receive as much lashback from the church because he was farther away from the Pope, whereas Galileo was pretty much right next door. Retrograde motion for Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, and where they directly oppose the sun in the sky is known as opposition. In this case, opposition is when planet lines up with the Earth and the sun. That is opposition. When at opposition, it is closest to the Earth, meaning it aligns all in one. Planetary alignment. Huge thing in, you know, sorcery and making divinations. Retrograde motion for Mercury and Venus, though, is a little different. It occurs as they move between the Sun and the Earth, which is known as conjunction. Every planet can be in conjunction for the outer planets and planets past Earth, so Mars all the way to Pluto. They can be at conjunction by being opposite from Earth. So Earth's on this side, and they are all on this side. But only Mercury and Venus can be in inferior conjunction. Only they can be between the Earth and the Sun. They cannot have opposition. Every planet can be in superior conjunction, which is when it's in the line in line with the Sun and the Earth. But the planet is on the far side of the Sun. Only Mercury and Venus can be in minor conjunction and superior conjunction. So let's reiterate. Reiteration, because I'm sure that was confusing. Let's try again. Opposition. When we have everything from Mercury or Mars to Neptune. They go on opposition, meaning they are in line with the Earth and the Sun all at once. Even the inner planets can be in there. Planetary alignment with the Earth in the middle. Sandwich. Opposition. Sandwich of outer planets, Earth, and Sun. The Earth is the peanut butter and the jelly. The outer planets and the Sun are the bread. When we get to Opposition, because only the outer planets from, again, Mars to Neptune can be in out opposition. Planets interior of Earth, Mercury and Venus, have inferior conjunction. This is when their retrograde motion occurs, okay? With inferior conjunction, they are the peanut butter and jelly. Earth and the sun are the bread. Every planet can be in conjunction by being in something called superior conjunction, which is when the Earth is on this side, the Sun is in the middle, and all the other planets are on this side. That is conjunction. In this case, the Sun is the peanut butter and the jelly, the Earth is the bread, and our other planets are the bread. But only, only from Mars to Neptune can be in opposition just like only Mercury and Venus can have inferior conjunction. Copernicus found that he could determine the sizes of a planet's orbit from information on their planetary configuration. So for example, Mercury never goes farther than 28 degrees from the sun in our night sky. The largest angle of separation equals the grandest elongation. So separation meaning from the planet to where the sun is. 
from the sun to the planet. This is the angle of separation, which is known as greatest elongation. This is determined by the size of planetary orbits relative to the Earth. Venus and Mercury have circular orbits around the sun, and using trigonometry, you can find the orbits by using the planetary angle of elongation. But for other planets, you can determine their sizes by looking how long it took from them to move from opposition to the quadrangle. Okay, so remember in that image earlier, you had Earth, planet, planet, planet. Okay, this was opposition, this was quadrangle. So the amount of time it takes to move from opposition to the quadrangle allows you to determine the size of the orbit. You couldn't determine the Earth's actual distance from the sun, so he labeled the distance as one astronomical unit. So if Jupiter, for example, was five times the distance, then it would be five astronomical units. And it was pretty spot on. To this day, we call the distance from the sun to the Earth one astronomical unit. Copernicus published his findings in 1543 which circulated privately before then for about 30 years. And it was met with a lot of opposition because it couldn't protect better than Ptolemy's model. Reason? Because he assumed all of the planets had perfect circular orbits. In the next century, it would be found different. It would be found that they actually were ellipses, which would make everything make sense. The other reason was because there was no stellar parallax. And so counter-arguments arose. Stars too distant to form a parallax that we can see. Copernicus's model was much simpler explanation and didn't seem to just occur on coincidence. A stellar parallax is seeing how stars move. And the counter-argument to that was, well, they're so far away. How are we supposed to see a parallax? And the other thing was, even though it couldn't predict better than Ptolemy's model, it was much simpler and it did not seem to be coincidence. Holly's model, everything seemed to just coincidentally be on point, or mostly on point. And there's this thing with science. In science, we really like simplicity, which is why we call it, we still use the Copernicus, Copernican model. Um, but the biggest issue was that it was a counter to the long-standing beliefs set by Aristotle, which was supported by the Catholic Church. So you're in the 1500s, 1400s. The Church is the law. We're in the Dark Ages slash early Renaissance era. The church is the law. If you go against the church, you're in trouble. King Henry created his own church, and it caused a lot of wars. Spain tried to attack England in order to bring them back to Catholicism. Um, it caused internal feuds within England because you had people who were Catholic and people who were Protestant. Kings trying to switch it back and forth and back and forth caused a big issue. So religion, huge influencer right now. So having it opposed. This gigantic influencer was big. So if the Earth is a planet, then it must hold no special place in the universe. And that means that couldn't be possible because God made us. We are special. Therefore, we should be the center of the universe. Right? Yeah, obviously. That's how it should work. And then they had a smaller issue. Accepting that the Earth spun and traveled at great speeds that we weren't able to detect. This was during the Renaissance era, and it started to become more and more accepted, and by the late 1500s, the English astronomer Thomas Diggs argued in favor of the Copernican model, and saying that stars may be other suns at various farther distances and may also have planets. The Italian philosopher and monk Giordano Bruno went a tad far, stating that these other planets were in fact inhabited, and for that he was burned at the stake in 1600. Again, don't cross the church right now. Despite the suppression of this, more and more scientists began to question the geocentric model for the heliocentric model and looking at distant stars and questioning, are they suns? Are there actually more planets? Now we're going to move on to precision astronomical measurements now that we've had a little bit of a history lesson. Um, and we're going to go further into history and we're going to start with Tycho Brahe who was from Dutch nobility, so he had a lot of money and a lot of interest in studying the heavens. He used his wealth to build one of the biggest observatories in Europe. Unfortunately, it's not around anymore, 
Um, but the land that it stood on is still there, and you can still see some of the, uh, what was left. Tycho felt that God had put the heavens in the sky to be used as signs to mankind of events on Earth. Interest in the heavens led him to making the most accurate measurements before a telescope was even invented. Concerning the positions of planets down to one arc minute, that is one sixteenth of a degree, and that is incredibly impressive and probably very straining on your eyes. In 1572, he saw a supernova and showed it maintained a fixed position on the celestial sphere, meaning that it was actually outside of our solar system. In 1577, a comet appeared and he determined it was located out past the moon. And so it was not actually in Earth's atmosphere like it was previously believed. Quick, quick backwards here. Scientists believed and people believed that comets were in our atmosphere. They just formed miraculously. And there were bad omens or good omens. Comets were a huge deal in the old ancient world all the way up to the Renaissance. They used it as markers for when a war should start, a war should end, if um, something good was going to happen, if there was going to be a drought or a famine. It meant all these different things. And it was very fascinating. And this was actual, like, believed scientific, quote unquote, scientific fact. Druids predicted this. Priests predicted this. It was a huge deal. He determined it was not actually in our atmosphere. He found it was out in our solar system. He did not believe that the planets orbited the sun, and he never determined the Earth to be a planet. He decided something else. He said, okay. Earth orbits the sun, but Earth is not a planet. Instead, Earth will orbit the sun and the planets will orbit Earth. That makes just so much more sense. His young assistant, though, Johannes Kepler, was brilliant with geometry. When Brahe died, his work passed on to Kepler. Uh, Kepler and Tycho did not always get along. Kepler actually got fired multiple times, but he would always come back because Brahe needed him. Anyway, um, so when... Brahe passed on. Kepler studied his findings and was able to map Mars' orbit. He found it wasn't circular, but an ellipse. He also found the sun was not at the center of this elliptical orbit, but off-center. And this is where things get interesting. So here's our sun. Instead of having this lovely, perfect orbit like this, where and now it looks like a fried egg, instead, we have an ellipse. But now, instead of the sun being the center, he's saying, no, no, not like that. Instead, it's like this. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? That means out here, we're actually taking more time to move. But here, we're going much faster. Time is going quicker. Well, not that time is going quicker. More of it is moving quicker here, almost like a slingshot. And he was able to apply this to the other planets. This has a lot to do with Earth's seasons. He discovered the relationship between the size of a planet's orbit and its orbital period, or time around the sun. The period depends on the part of the ellipse called the major axis, or the long side of the ellipse, which is actually this side right here. So if we're going to use this dude, here is our, our major axis, and it's particularly the semi-major axis, so half of the major axis. We're going to draw this out to the best of my ability on here. Bear with me. So the period depends in part on the ellipse along the major axis. So here is our major axis. It goes from here to here. Major axis, which we're going to call A. Okay? It, this will increase with the increase of the semi-major axis, but not equally. The square of the orbital period in years equals the cube of the semi-major axis in astronomical units. Period will increase with the increase of the semi-major axis but not equally. So we see the period, P squared, is equal to A cubed. This is what you need to remember. P squared equals A cubed. Orbital period squared equals the cube of the semi-major axis, and this will be given in astronomical units. His discoveries he wrote down into three laws. Planets move in elliptical orbits, with the sun at one focus of the ellipse. Two. The orbital speed of a planet varies so that a line joining the sun and the planet will sweep over equal areas in equal time intervals. Three, the amount of time a planet takes to orbit the sun, known as P, is related to its orbit's size, which is A. 
So we get p squared equals a cubed. Do not forget that. You will need to know all three of these. Kepler's laws were based off of empirical evidence rather than theoretical ideas. He actually had physical findings, physical measurements in order to do this. So these laws actually remain valid to this day. And the third law is extremely important. Uh, but later scientists realized these laws could all be derived from the fundamental laws about nature of motion and gravity. But the third law is the most important because it implies that planets nearer the sun orbit faster and planets with larger orbits orbit slower. This difference in speed explained retrograde motion and that's what was so important. It explains retrograde motion and it allowed scientists to predict the period of any body orbiting the sun. All right, so let's do an example. A for Pluto. Okay. The semi-major axis or A is 40 astronomical units. Okay. So we have A cubed equals P squared. So I want you to do this with me. So go get a calculator. Um, so I want you to do this together. So we're going to start with 40 cubed equals P squared, which leads to 64,000 equals P squared. Now I want you to try to figure this out. Okay, should have it by now. Square root of 64,000 is going to be 250 years. Our modern measurements, though, show that its semi major axis is actually 39.48, not 40, as it was assumed. Um, so its or orbital period is actually 248.1 years. So it's actually pretty close. And this is how we can figure that out. As long as you have the semi-major axis, you are good. So now let's do Halley's Comet. Here we know that its orbital period is 76 years. So we're going to do it backwards. We have P squared equals A cubed. So I want you to go ahead and do 76 squared. You should have gotten 76 squared to be 5,800, right? So now we need to cube root it. So I'll give you a second to do that. You should have gotten 18 meaning that A is equal to 18 astronomical units. The major axis is 36 astronomical units. Therefore, Halley has an elliptical orbit bringing it out past Pluto into the Kuiper belt. All right, so now we're going to talk about Galileo Galilei. His interest fell in studying all aspects of motion, and he studies the mo studied the motions of heavenly bodies with his, again, new at the time, telescope. He determined many interesting things from his study of the heavens. He found that the moon has mountains, making it a ball of rock. Um, he found that the sun had sunspots or dark spots and blemishes that changed daily, meaning it wasn't a perfect celestial orb and that it rotated. Observations were evidence that the sun and moon were actually physical bodies, making it hard to, harder to explain how they would zip across the sky and around the earth in 24 hours. He discovered the first four moons of Jupiter, which were determined to be called the Galilean satellites forevermore. Um, he indicated that not all bodies orbited Earth and refuted the idea that if the moon orbited Earth while Earth moved, it would fall behind. He determined that Saturn was round with two satellites, its rings, that stayed in permanent spots. At this time, he did not know it was rings. He thought they were physically satellites because he couldn't see that they it was a ring. He thought they were just two two things orbiting it. Um, he looked at the, the faint band of light on the celestial sphere, uh, what we call the Milky Way, and determined an uncountable amount of stars, more than anyone could have imagined. And this truly shook geocentrists. His last observation of Venus indicated it rotated around the sun and had phases like our moon. The geocentric model indicated that we would never see more than a crescent phase perpetually lit from behind. The heliocentric model predicted it would both cross in front of and behind of the sun. When behind it is small in our view, but mostly fully illuminated, meaning it has a full cycle. When passing between the sun and the earth, it's large, but the lit side would face the sun, creating a crescent shape. And this is what he observed. He observed both. He observed a fully illuminated full Venus and a crescent Venus. And this left no doubt that Venus orbited the sun. And if Venus orbited the sun, then so must the Earth. The only problem for Galileo's was that he got in trouble with the church. 
He was very vocal in support of Copernican view and a heliocentric uni universe. He circulated his views and observations and findings very widely and a tad tactically. Um, so he knew the Pope, but he wasn't very tactful in the way that he gave his views. He kind of would, would write things in a way that kind of made a bad mark on the church. Anyway, so his, his findings not only were considered heresy, um, but the way that he did it kind of didn't help. Uh, and being that it was during a time you could get burned at the stake for heresy, he actually got off rather easy, thanks to knowing people in the church who were like, well, he's my friend. Um, and so he was put under house arrest for the remainder of his life, and he had to recant his heresy. But in 1992, the Catholic Church admitted it was wrong in condem condemning Galileo. So now we're going to move on to Newton. Newton was interesting. Um, Newton's super religious, but he made a ton of contributions to physics, maths, and astronomy. He also pioneered modern studies of motion, optics, and gravity. He wrote a lot theologically as well as scientifically. I just, I just want to point out that a lot of Newton's findings that he made of the laws of motion and stuff was done because he was bored. Um, to, to make, to make this clearer. He was bored because he had to go home from university because there was a smallpox outbreak. So he did this. I think that's pretty fantastic. If you think about it, if you're so bored that you determine the laws of motion. In trying to understand the motions of the moon, he deducted the laws of gravity and created calculus. Calculus. He created math. And he was like 17. What's cool is what he found in the 17th century is the basis for making spacecraft trajectory today. He found the laws of motion, or, well, he discovered the laws of motion. Um, he determined what inertia was. Inertia causes an object to resist changes in either speed or direction. Uh, so let's take you driving and you have a bag on the front seat of your car and you're going straight, then make a turn. The bag will slide or tip over. Because it's not trying to turn with you, it's actually trying to resist that turn and continue going in the direction and speed from before. So unless you put an opposing force on it, like your hand, it will keep moving until it runs into something, like the door or your floor. As speed and direction of motion are both important in this, we call it velocity. To simplify the first law, a body maintains a constant velocity unless forces act upon it. So for example, a ball will keep rolling until something stops it. We measure inertia based on an object's mass, or the amount of matter an object contains, and it does not depend on the environment. Its weight, the force that pulls it down, and which is a measure of the external forces acting upon it, therefore depends on the environment. This is important to astronomy because force in an orbit. So the fact that the planets are orbiting the sun in an orbit indicates there is a force acting upon it, like gravity. The force acting on an object equals the product of its acceleration and its mass. This helps us produce acceleration. The amount of acceleration that a body will experience is equal to the force applied divided by the body's mass. So force over mass equals acceleration. When two bodies interact, they create equal and opposite forces on each other. This is known as the law of action reaction. Both the object that exerts the force and the object receiving the force will feel it equally. Okay? Very important. So, for example, this girl, X, pushes the boy, Y, and they are both on skateboards. Both will move away at the same speed, but if the boy has a greater mass than the girl, who's in this one, she will move away at a greater speed than he will because there will be less force necessary to get her to move. So if you are on a skateboard yourself and you push upon someone the same size as you, you both move at equal speeds. If you push against someone bigger than you, you will move away much faster than they will. Which if you have a small cousin or you were small and you remember doing this to your dad, if you were both standing on skateboards and you pushed your dad, you would move away much faster. And so now we're, we, this is how we move on to Newton's universal law of gravitation. Um, every mass exerts a force of attraction on every other mass. 
The strength of the force is directly proportional to the product of the masses divided by the square of the distance between them. The law of gravity allows astronomers to predict the positions and motions of the planets and other astronomical bodies. In this case, we have big M and little m. These are the masses of the two objects that we are talking about. Okay, so we have two objects. If either m or m, so the mass of one of these objects changes, but everything else remains the same, then the force will increase by the same amount, and this is called direct proportionality. But if distance, or g, changes, then you have something else altogether. In this case, if distance changes between the objects, the force becomes weaker, and it will weaken as the square of the distance, meaning you're going to double it. If you have a distance of 2, so it increases by 2, it will instead increase by 4. And this is the inverse square proportionality. It is because of this law that we understand that all objects dropped on Earth will accelerate to the same rate when dropped from the proper height. And this is known as surface gravity. It is completely independent of the mass of the object, but on the mass and radius of the Earth, or body, and gravitational constant. So generally, g is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th newtons times meters squared per kilogram squared. And this is how we predict positions and motions. It's really neat. Um, and I know it seems super complicated, but g doesn't change. g is a constant. d and our m's can change. And this will affect force. So if only m and m change, force will change equally. If d changes, then it is doubled. That is Newton's universal law of gravitation. And that is it for our lecture. I know it's pretty short. I hope you're happy. Uh, and I will see you guys next time.